Welcome to the first episode of Series 52, everyone. I am excited for this one because it involves pop culture knowledge that I actually <laughs> knew, which is a first and a big moment for me. Um, yeah. I hope everybody else enjoys this as much as I did. Um, but this was this was so great. It was, so it was great. a lot of fun. It was so much fun. Some of my favorite shows. We have so much more to say about uh, everything that, that goes on in the series after the episode, uh, including a quick personal message from me uh, and an exciting and extraordinarily time sensitive mm -hmm. opportunity for our patrons. So please stay tuned after the episode. Uh, these cold opens really are getting extremely brief, aren't they? They are, but I'm okay with it. It's fine. Uh, we will see you after the show, everyone. Enjoy this first episode of our Under the Neighborhood series. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I am one of your hosts, Ryan. In this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome Kyle Decker, GM of the Quest Friends podcast and creator of the game that we are covering this month, Under the Neighborhood. Kyle, welcome to Character Creation Cast. I am really excited about this game. Yeah. This is going to be, so. I well, here, I'm going to show you. I have, this is my, I was Grunkle Stan for Halloween. So I just, <laughs> that's right here. I can't wear it with my headphones, but um, I'm, pr I'm pretty excited about this. One of the best parts about this game, or at least me doing it with other folks, and one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is we end up just talking about the shows and how great they are. And that's yeah. just, a, it's just nice. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, sometimes it's fun to just be excited about things, yeah. you know? Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, what kind of projects you have going on, where people can find you, that kind of stuff? Yeah. You can find me at Quest Friends, where I've put all my eggs in a single Quest Friendian basket. <laughs> uh, yeah. Quest Friends podcast, which I'll get more into probably later once we've talked about the game. But Quest Friends, it's an actual play with me and my best friends. We go on quests. Oh, quest I see what you did there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's what me and every other Quest Friends in existence uh -huh. thought of. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and right now we are doing this will surprise you we are doing a campaign inspired by shows like gravity falls using a little system that people may or may not hear about called under the neighborhood mm -hmm. oh i think i heard <laughs> of that earlier maybe maybe <laughs> which is why i won't really get into it uh too much right now because that's the main thing i do and i feel like i best best to talk about how we will apply the game once the game has been explained. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> that does make sense. Uh, well, well, let's go ahead then and get into this, and we'll start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. What is the core concept of Under the Neighborhood? Yeah, so the, co the core concept of Under the Neighborhood is it is meant to emulate what I call dual-world kids' cartoons, because I haven't really... I don't know if there's an actual name for it, but essentially shows that you would find like Amphibia or mm -hmm. the Owl House, Gravity Falls, Star versus the Forces of Evil. Basically a lot of Disney shows, although I will never put the Disney market on my <laughs> show because I don't want the mouse coming after me. No. Uh, yep. But it definitely has that inspiration. The idea is you have characters, often kids going into these wonderful worlds it's often, you know, the the contrast between our mundane reality and this fantastical world. But an important twist is that the fantastical world is also often very mundane. And that is part of the joke, like Star versus the Forces of Evil. They have a wonderful, magical fantasy store called Quest Buy. 
Yep. <laughs> or uh, Amphibia. You know, this wonderful world of medieval frog creatures, and the main characters are called the planters, and they have a farm of vegetables. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the kind of thing. It's this fun relationship between our mundane world mm-hmm. and this magical world that is also in turn mundane. And the game is basically meant to recreate that energy that is in a surprising amount of at least my favorite animated shows. I hadn't even thought about that like mundane part though. And now I'm thinking about like, I'm, I'm watching Owl House right now. Um, but that like very first episode where they have to go get the crown and it's just like a Burger King crown mm-hmm. and Luz is so disappointed that like, <laughs> she's like, this is, we did all this for this. And it's like, Yep. <laughs> yeah, or one of my favorite examples is Gravity Falls, the episode, I don't know the name, but it's the Fight Fighters episode where Dipper brings a Street Fighter character to life and has mm-hmm. to do a f- duel with him. But it all starts because he made an angry teen mad at him and got challenged to a du- got challenged to like a fight behind the school, which of course, isn't something that happens every day, but it is a pretty mundane thing mm-hmm. that then yeah. spiraled into, you know, suddenly Ken from Street Fighter is alive and out for blood. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's amazing. I mean, it, it kind of feels like these shows have uh, almost an isekai uh, genre feel to them. Uh, but instead of like going to this other world and inhabiting this other uh, type of being, it's more of a I've got. Uh, myself into this other world, right? Yeah, I've I've definitely. The more I thought about this while making it, I definitely thought about isekai a lot. It's 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 boring isekai. <laughs> right. <laughs> boring, boring, right? <laughs> boring is the wrong word, but the, I, right. It's the funny word. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's isekai adjacent, right? Yeah. No, it's like the but like in Gravity Falls when they go through like the bottomless pit and then it's like it is but like they just keep going around in the circle and like that's what it feels like. It's like you you fall into this thing but it's not really anything at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, we've kind of covered it a little bit. Um but can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of setting this game has? Um and and particularly I'm interested in how you balance that mundane and magical world. Yeah. So the game exists in three settings. It's got some sample settings, but it's really designed for you to make your own or plug in your favorite from a show. And each setting has three worlds to it. The mundane, which is just Earth. The magical, which is our, you know, our frog world or our mysterious part of the woods behind Gravity Falls or our boiling aisles from the owl house. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other. Whereas the magical is a magical world that still people relatively act like they do in the mundane world. Like they're not really that different, even if they're often magical creatures. The other is weird. It is strange. It is dangerous. An example could be Gravity Falls. While the main show Gravity Falls features a sleepy town and then these magical creatures that live in the woods outside of it. So the mundane is that sleepy town and then the woods outside of it is the magical. The other would be the weird stuff that ends up happening where you have like an other dimension with an evil triangle man that could cause Armageddon if set loose. (laughs) And a surprising amount of these shows have it. Star vs. the Forces of Evil, you have Earth, uh, a small town. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's kind of like the USA Southwest. And then you've got Muni, which is this fantasy kingdom. And then you've got a realm full of the literal source of magic. Mm -hmm. And so that's where our settings are. And the way the game walks you through development is essentially through making each of those. So there are a list of questions But each of them can be summed up by one. The mundane is basically, where on Earth do you want to be? You're going to be on Earth, but do you want to be, say, where my game is, set in a small valley that's like Phoenix, Arizona? Or do you want to be in the Pacific Northwest? The magical is all, take Earth, add a single trait to it, a single twist. The Boiling Isles, Earth, but witches are real. Um, Amphibia. It's like Earth, 
but there are frog people to it. Okay. Like, mm-hmm. there's more to it, but there's usually that one twist. Yeah. Right. And then the other is basically, the other is just make something weird. And it's more, yeah. what's its relationship to the other things? Is it this weird otherworldly place? Is it the source of magic? That's where the most flexibility is because while it's there and it's important, it's really the relationship between those first two worlds, the mundane and the magical, that is what's most important. I was reaching for my dice because I see that we have dice rolls possibly coming up. <laughs> oh, uh, but I'm getting way. ahead of myself here. I'll have to get them. Uh, speaking of dice, uh, what tools do we need to play this game? Let me find in the rule book because I have I have that written down. I have it written down at the beginning of the rule book in the super cheesy way that includes both literal tools and figurative tools. (laughs) So according to the rule book, in order to play, all you need is a handful of six sided dice, also called D6, a character sheet for each player except for the game master, a few hours to play, a few pieces of scrap paper, a willingness to have fun and say yes to everyone else's ideas. I butchered that last line. And the scrap paper is optional, It's for a gameplay tool where you could do it verbally or via scrap paper, but essentially character sheets, dice, excitement. Very cool. All right. Um, So again, a thing that we've kind of touched on here, but I want to go a little bit deeper. What kind of themes do you want people to explore in these kinds of games? And again, in particular, I want to know what about these kinds of TV shows appeal to you? Like what made you want to, make a game about these kinds of stories yeah a term that one of the content editors one of the people who read the book gave to me that i really liked was a term called curiously ordinary i think what i really like about these settings more so than settings that are pure slice of life or settings that are pure, we're going to go out and we're going to have an adventure, is how the settings can be weird and fantastical and you can have these opportunities for comedy and fun that you couldn't necessarily have in a setting without these fantastical things, but they never lose the sight that ordinary people is the focus of them. And when I've ever creative stuff, even when I've done other things, like uh, when I ran a Numenera game, I basically turned it into this kind of setting where everything was really mundane, even though it's a future fantastical post-apocalyptic world. I think there's just something about using these fantastical settings in order to further reinforce regular people's lives and regular people's struggles is very interesting and it's Mm. a lot of fun and so you get the silliness but you also get the it's funny because it's true kind of thing right yeah i think again because i've been watching a lot of these shows because my kids just we all went as gravity falls characters for halloween and they are watching owl house and they just finished star um but I, I love the fact that it's these really normal, like mundane kind of coming of age stories in a lot of them. Mm-hmm. But like with weird stuff, I think about um, like Mabel when she's like in love with Mermando. And, you know, it's like that's such a like a normal like girl goes to the swimming pool in the summer and there's this hot boy. And, you know, and it's like except that he's also a mermaid. Um, <laughs> and, so you know, it's just like that little bit of weirdness, but it's still totally relatable as like a story that we've all kind of experienced or seen before in in regular, normal, mundane TV shows. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's why it became so popular for kids as well, because there are other shows out there where it's like, oh, you as a kid get to go on a fantastical adventure after gaining some magical superpower, but these are just kids as they are with excitement and gumption who still get to do these Mm -hmm. wonderful things. Yeah, yeah. They're totally normal, regular kids. Like, you could be them. Um, I mean, in a lot of cases, anyway. Uh, Yeah, I hadn't thought really quite about that, like, mix of mundane in there. Um, yeah, it's really intriguing. Yeah, it's really interesting. I know. I know Hilda's another really big one. Oh, I yeah, love Hilda. I love Hilda's Hilda. so good. So good. Gosh. 
These are all great. <laughs> I haven't watched Amphibia, but um, all the other ones I'm yeah. super familiar with. Yeah. I've watched the Weird Mageddon episodes like so many times. And it was <laughs> so like he would watch them on repeat like every morning for a while. So, so many times. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do characters do then specifically in this game? So what characters do in this game is, can I actually combine this with the next question? Because I think that's the best way of oh, yeah. Yeah, go summarizing for it. Because the next one's uh, what's unique about this game. Yeah, and I think now that we've talked about mundanity, it's important to get to this game's core mechanic, which is what we call a slice of life complication. So when designing this game, I knew I wanted to do what these kids shows do. You go off on a fun, silly adventure that is pretty isolated. So a single session can be its own isolated, episodic adventure. Mm -hmm. But it has this mundane element to it. And when looking at all these shows, I realized that the core behind every conflict that I, as I had mentioned earlier, was often something mundane. It could either be, you know, something like I made a school bully mad or I'm trying to think of another one. Oh, another Gravity Falls one. My sister won a pig at the fair. Yes. Is... <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, OK, first of all, Waddles is like the cutest pig ever. And I totally I love understand. Him. Why I love she, him so much. Like, I love Waddles so much. OK, carry on. <laughs> but it always and and so sometimes it was just weird sometimes especially in something like amphibia it started from you know one of those we're going to teach kids a moral lesson thing so like a character is afraid to lie or a character wants to get out and and is pushing someone else into it so essentially what all of these adventures are and the ones that you'll do in under the neighborhood is you go off on a silly isolated adventure that starts from something mundane mm-hmm. And the way we do this is through a mechanic called slice of life complications. Essentially, at the beginning of every session, each of the players picks one of the other party members. They can either pick someone independently or they can go clockwise or counterclockwise, pick someone to their left and to their right. And what they do is they come up with a complication for that character. So some example ones that my players have done are... Uh, this character's coffee machine is broken uh, or this character had this character is trying to relax, but there is a woodpecker outside of their house that mm. won't stop bothering them. <laughs> or my personal favorite, this character really wants to go see this movie, but it's PG 13 and she is 11 years old and without a guardian. Oh no. Oh, I hate when that happens. <laughs> so essentially, everyone will suggest one of these complications. And then as a group, they will pick one or sometimes two or three of these complications that they find really entertaining. Mm-hmm. So maybe of those, maybe those three were presented and our group decides we're going to go with the coffee maker is broken. And the players all decide this as a group. The GM can hop in, but it's typically accepted that the GM doesn't say anything or at least doesn't exert their force because this is meant to be the players really taking initiative over the story and then after that the gm comes in and takes the fantastical world and applies it to this mundane complication Mm. and suddenly you're fighting the coffee queen you know, empress of all things caffeinated (laughs) because she is furious that you dare destroy her precious coffee mug of wisdom or something like that. (laughs) And so that mechanic is really, I think, explains what characters do in this game, but also what I think makes it unique. Characters start by living mundane things and then the world enhances those into bigger problems and then they go off and they adventure they try to solve the mess that more often than not the slice of life complication made them cause Mm. oh i really like that i really love the players kind of picking what that thing is and then the gm being like okay but actually (laughs) also this other thing (laughs) yeah Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun great absolutely um so the the history of this game when did you actually start developing it then so Game development started, depending on how you count it, either half a year ago or a year and a half ago. Mm. So 
about a year before we finished the first campaign of Quest Friends, which was a Numenera campaign, we started discussing what do we want for our second season. And we specifically focused on what mechanics do we want and what kind of world do we want. And we had decided, you know what, we all really love Gravity Falls, The Owl House. We love those kinds of shows and we love ghosts. So Mm -hmm. let's tell a story that's like Gravity Falls, but in a world where the realm of the dead was only a plane ride away. So you could just fly to the afterlife and then you could have, you know, ghosts and skeletons just hanging around in the land (laughs) of the living. And so after that, we started looking for a series of games, basically trying to find something that fit what we wanted. So we tried Genesis. We tried a handful of Powered by the Apocalypse games like Interstitial Mm -hmm. and um, trying to think of the... It's the edgy, the edgy one with werewolves. Uh, Urban oh, Shadows. Uh, Urban Shadows. Urban Shadows. I'm so glad you knew that immediately. <laughs> and, uh, and Urban Shadows. And I had been really trying to find a game that fit exactly what we wanted. And uh, there, yeah, none was, of those are quite right for what you're describing. None of those were quite right. Like each of them had their own thing, like interstitial. I'm very open about the fact that I took a lot of inspiration from that. And uh, Urban Shadows had a lot of kind of the world that we wanted, but it was focused more on, you know, shadows in an urban environment, mm-hmm. which were two things that we weren't looking for. We were looking for goofy, silly fun in right. we're set in like a small town so it is urban but less so yeah. than than urban shadows mm-hmm. so after some consideration and after playing those games we decided you know what L- what if i just made my own what if i just made my own system that not only fit the setting that we wanted exactly but also fit the mechanics we wanted Because while a lot of the mechanics in the game are there because I mean, they're there because I think they're the best mechanics. But I also chose some specifically because I knew my group of players Mm. would work really well for it because that was first and foremost who it was for. And so, yeah, after that, about a year later, after we played all those games, I sat down, made a list of all the things about the games that I liked, all the things that I thought, you know, this works really well. And then I sat down and I was like, well, what's the game's twist? Mm -hmm. We want a show like Gravity Falls in a realm with the living and the dead. If I turn this into a game, what is the core thing I need to focus on? And then that's when we got to the slice of life mechanic because I started thinking, well, what are other shows we like? And then I'm like, well, all of these shows have two worlds. And then I ended up realizing they have three and I added the other. But they, (laughs) I was like, you know, Amphibia. The Owl House, Gravity Falls, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, they're all Earth and not Earth. That's that's mm-hmm. all of their setup. And then uh, from there, I I just started adding things. So mm-hmm. I started thinking, well, what's what's the adventures of these worlds? Oh, they're all mundane. Let's add a slice of life mechanic. And so everything kind of snowballed from there mm-hmm. when I realized, you know, the story we want to tell what does it have in common with other stories like that? And then here we were. I love that. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I like when people say like, okay, here's, here's what I want this game to feel like. Here's what I want it to do. How do I make it do that? Um, Kind of working backwards from that. Like, here's the, here's the feeling I want you to have. And the thing that I want to emulate, how do I get there? You know, rather than saying like, Here's a bunch of mechanics. I want, I definitely want D6s and I want skills and let's see what happens, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that's why I struggled for a while because I was working from that other lens. Yeah. Until I read insightful advice from, from folks on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I want to say it was probably a J Dragon thread about like bite or something like that, about yeah. like specificity. And I was like, oh, Oops, I (laughs) should be doing that. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, I mean, there's something to be said for like saying, okay, this is exactly what I want a game to do, you know, that it doesn't need to be broad or general or, you know, because like that's, Mm -hmm. I think, what makes using something like Genesis kind of difficult in these situations is like you had a very specific idea of what you wanted this game to be. And yes, you can emulate some of that in Genesis, but Genesis isn't meant to do one specific genre it's meant to do all the things and it means that it doesn't necessarily do all of them well 
Mm -hmm. you know, so. That's very true. And I, I like that you, I like that you just took the concept and like, I'm just going to make a game, you know, yep. that doesn't exist. Let's make it. Right. Well, I, I figured, you know, from an actual play marketing standpoint, I was already going to get specific enough that there was no real benefit for working with an established game. So I might as well just make my own. Might as well, right. Well, and I mean, honestly, from, you know, like from a marketing standpoint, I guess the world doesn't need another D&D podcast. You know, we don't need it. it so Yes, it is like a little bit more niche to run your own game, but you're also the only one doing that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're not in a saturated market of, okay, this is another vampire podcast, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said for that too. Yeah, absolutely. We're really close to sitting down and like making our characters. Before we do that, are there kind of basic terms that you think people should know to be able to follow along with what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. So a couple of terms that you might hear thrown around that wouldn't be in a lot of role-playing things. Mm -hmm. So I won't explain what a game master is, but okay. <laughs> uh, this is powered by the apocalypse, which is a, a very flexible term for a type of role-playing game, but you might hear that said a lot. Uh, some various terms that you might hear, you're going to hear moves. Moves is a term for basically abilities, things that you can do. Uh, if you hear basic moves, that means everybody can do it. If you hear a character move, that's something that's going to be a specific to your character. Mm -hmm. um, other things that you might hear, you're going to hear something called adventure points or AP. AP is a tool that essentially you can gain over the course of the game and you can you, you can spend it to do stuff. So as we look at some of our character moves, you might hear someone say, you know, use one AP to do this. That's what I mean. It's just a resource that you accumulate often by doing failed roles. Uh, you might hear various terms of success. Failure is the worst. Mixed success is medium. Full success is top. And then uh, uh, you might hear some stats. We have four stats, each representing different ideas. Hearts, book, fierce. Hearts, books, fierce, and slick. And then finally, a term that we use for session in Under the Neighborhood is adventure. So every time you sit down and play for a couple of hours, that's called an adventure. Hmm. Um, there are going to be other terms that I'll probably mention as soon as we get in, uh, okay. such as because our system is kind of a fusion of what I liked from Numenera and Powered by the Apocalypse. So character setup, the foundation of it is a bit different. But as for just miscellaneous terms you might hear those are going to be things you might hear if we randomly say it in a moves description that aren't i wouldn't consider them core to character setup in the way other things are so yeah. i'm just going to mention them here rather than as they come up awesome perfect if that works well are, are are we ready to uh make some people i'm ready Yes. Let's do make, I make a person too, or do yeah, I? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Do we need dice for character creation? Uh, no. Although okay. there was a step of there is a step that I completely forgot until right now. We can't make our people until we know what world we're playing in. <gasps> oh, Gasp. Ryan, it's world building time. Collaborative <laughs> world building. We need a sound bite for that. Apparently, we do. We do. I'll, I'll sing a little song um, later. <laughs> <laughs> after i think of it i'll, I'll think of a song yeah. I'll sing so we have you. a section in the book called designing your neighborhood uh we also have a pre-built setting in the book as well that is the world of hereafter the world of the podcast so you can we can either use that or we can go through designing your world and uh, we're gonna design a world <laughs> oh yeah please <laughs> okay so yeah, this section walks through the rules of the mundane, the magical, and the other, which as I had mentioned earlier, the mundane, you basically figure out where on earth are you, the magical, what makes this world different from earth, and then the other, it's a weird space, have fun. We can either just use those basic templates with which to create a world, otherwise the rule book does include specific setting creation prompts with specific questions for each of the worlds. And uh, 
dice rolls, either 1d6 or 2d6, depending. I do love random tables. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm good with, uh, doing some dice rolls and interpreting mm -hmm. from that. Okay. Perfect. I don't have any dice though. I have dice. But that's not the same. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I'll let you have the dice. I won't go out and I won't waste time going out there and getting them. There you go. I cleaned them up because I was trying to rearrange my desk. <laughs> if you want to look at the prompts as well, otherwise I can just read them. They're under the section, um, I'm going to pull up the specific page. They're under the section designing your neighborhood mm -hmm. and they're on page eight, page 12. If you're looking at the PDF pages. Yes. Yeah, I see. Them. I, I love the, the, the bits of art in this book too. Yeah, it's really cute. <laughs> I spent so long trying to find find an artist because we didn't have the budget for internal art. So I had to use one of those stock websites. So I searched so hard until I could find someone who had the specific style I was looking for. Oh, amazing. And I was really happy with what we had. here. Absolutely. Love, love my campfire skeleton. <laughs> yeah. It was very important to me that the campfire, I actually had to remove the campfire skeleton and I forced it back somewhere else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> worth it. It's so good. All right. All right. So, so what do we need to do first for creating this world? Uh, so. Oh, sorry, oh go, go ahead. ahead. That's fine. No. You can explain it. It's your game. No, you, you, you can explain it. I was explain. just going to read out of the book. So. Well, that's know. perfect. It looks like you roll a D6. <laughs> it does. Because uh, it looks like we're tackling the mundane world first. Yes. And it says, when does your adventure take place? So uh, you roll and I'll read what the answer is. How about that? All right. Here we go. So I can feel like I'm involved. <laughs> <laughs> I want to participate. I I rolled a three. All right. So <laughs> February 25th, 1997. February okay, 25th, is, 1997. Why? There are two very specific dates on this chart. <laughs> um, and and I, I believe it's just for pure chaos and confusion. But let me know. If there's uh... there's no real 1997 was largely because 80s nostalgia has moved to 90s nostalgia, but we're getting right. on the cusp of aughts nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, let's do a time in the late 90s. So we're not just Stranger Things, but also people are going to want that vibe of like, oh, kids in an older time. And then I did it for 2047 as well, because I thought, well, if I'm going to do a specific date for the 90s. Let's do a specific date for the... Makes perfect sense. For the near future. I like that. Yeah. All right. So Very cool. So we are... Uh, yeah, I think February 25th, 1997 is fine. That works great for me. All right. So the next question. Uh, where in the mundane does your adventure take place? Roll 1d6. Ooh, we got a four. All right. Which is in a quiet suburb. So we really are just off-brand Stranger Things. Really hitting that it, Stranger Things season four just released. I know. Cross marketing. <laughs> Pay us it's, Netflix. I know it's the it's the nineties <laughs> version of Stranger Things uh, with yeah. uh, different big hair and yeah. uh, plastic cups with uh, with weird uh, patterns on them. Yeah, and the monsters that appear are just gonna ask you what's for supper. Uh huh. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so the magical. Okay, okay magical ready? world. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh, this. What makes the magical world different from the man from the mundane? Okay, so uh, if you, it says if you want your magical to stand out even more, instead of choosing one, uh, we can we can roll twice. Mm -hmm. Uh, should I just roll twice? Yeah, go ahead and roll two, and then we'll add them up. Yeah, it looks like uh, 2d6. Here, it's yep. between 2 and 12. Get that nice clinking dice sound. Ooh, I rolled uh, Snake Eyes. Two. Uh, it has people with magical powers. Okay. Uh, magic users, superheroes. Okay. We want a second one, I hope, right? Yeah. Well, obviously. Yeah. Don't be ridiculous, right? We got to figure out where these magical powers come from. In the words of my mother, the only stupid question is one you already know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Then we got a nine for this one. Uh, it's high in the sky or in space. Ooh. All right. Are we just making... Are, 
have we just made Stranger Things plus Sky High? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the the high school in the sky uh, with You're superheroes. superheroes. <laughs> right. That's perfect. Fine. Okay. Okay. So. Looks like we have some where. More. Yeah, where do the magical creatures Mon come from? Magicals creatures. I can. And I can Mon words. is referring to we have a one of the character options is someone who can have little Pokemon style creatures called Mon. Ooh. Which is why we need to explain. What are our beautiful critters? That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I rolled a five for this one. Which is the other. <gasps> they Gasp. come from the mysterious third world. All right. Wait. Well, I gotta highlight these so that I remember them later. Okay. Are you taking notes too? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I'm writing right on my... On my oh, video. fancy. <laughs> Look at you. Uh, Yeah. And uh, the next one. Are people from the magical and the mundane aware of each other? Ooh. Roll the d6. Four. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we really are just doing Sky High. <laughs> it is becoming very... When did Sky High come out? It had to be like the early 2000s. Uh, probably. Right? I feel like yes, because I feel like I've not seen it, but I know it's something that my siblings... July 29th, 2005. Okay, so yeah, we're about that eight years out. off. Yeah. Uh-huh. Never seen it. That's, why, that's what, around when I graduated college. I rewatched it for some reason the other day, and I don't know. I no, one of my friends who we thought would have loved it as a kid never saw it. Mm. It was surprisingly still all right. Yeah, and my dad that. watched it not that long ago. We like, yeah, stumbled. And he was like, "I'm watching Sky High," and we're like, "Why though?" <laughs> <laughs> all right, how do you travel between worlds? Ooh, fancy! All right, one d six for this. It's a six. Mm-hmm. Uh, through a choreographed dance. Oh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> it's too bad it's a podcaster. I'd insist that we come up with the dance. I know. Well, we can describe <laughs> it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. So now we are on to the other. What is the other? Please roll one D6. All right. Here's the last. A three. A cluster of other magical worlds. Oh. Ooh. Okay. So let's let's recap real quick here. Everybody following along at home. It is February 25th, 1997. We are in a quiet suburb. Uh, the magical world has people with magical powers. Um, and it is in, it's high in the sky or in space. Mm-hmm. We'll have to decide that. Um, the magical creatures are from the other. So I assume that they're like leaking in somehow. Right? From, yeah. from the other okay. magical cluster of worlds, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and... People in the mundane world are aware of the magical world and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, you travel between those worlds by doing a choreographed dance. Yep. Um, and the other is made up a clu- of a cluster of magical worlds. So, yeah, Ooh. that makes sense. I don't know if you've ever watched The Magicians, but like all of the donuts, you know. Am I the only one that understands this reference? <laughs> I'm, nope. so, I'm so sorry. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine. I, Whenever they like zoom out between like the like real world and like the magical world, like in, it's like a bunch of earths, but they all look like donut. Like they're like donut oh, shapes. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's what I meant. Like these floating. Can, can I, inside. can I pitch something? I mean, sure. Cause we, Go we, we gotta it. make sense of all this, right? Yeah. Well, so, I think it makes perfect sense. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> um, so the world that we are on is earth-like, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. With earth-like tech and from 1997, etc. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but what if this Earth-like planet was actually a moon around a gas giant and the other world, or the magical world, is our moon that is kind of, like, with us? And I so, feel like, like we all already, these other... like, kind of did that weird swapping thing last series. Weird swapping thing? No. Where, like, the past was the present and the present was the past? I mean, I guess that's fair, but no, this is more of like so this a, is like our moon, and this then is not more moon. of like a solar uh, conjunction of planets. So, like, the planets are actually moons near each other. So this cluster I feel like of I want planets, the mundane to just be like like super mundane, like yeah. actual Earth. Yeah, I just we want it to be like that. regular, like. But we know that there's you know, 
magical right. stuff. Right. Yeah, I think if uh, I think when it comes to the mundane, um, we definitely you definitely can put the mundane in the context of something else, especially when you start thinking of the other. You know, if you want to think of the overall context. But when it comes to fleshing out the mundane, my focus is really I, I really think the small details like mm -hmm. we're in a small town. But like I would I, the details I would think of is like, what's the name of our small town? And what's like the one hyper specific thing that the suburb is like known for? Like where I grew up, I grew up in a town called uh, Slinger, Wisconsin, and we had Yay! the <laughs> We're from you Wisconsin, so I, oh, well, okay. I'm in Germantown, Ooh. and Ryan is in Appleton. Oh, oh yeah, outside Appleton. Yeah, yes. so we know yeah. where Slinger is. Yeah, I know I'm like right by there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I like Germantown. That's where my doctor was. Well, close yeah, to Germantown. Yeah, so like I the got... Roberts frozen custard, where everybody yeah, goes. My after. dad loves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. but like Slinger's got the fastest quarter mile. It's a quarter mile Speedway. race track. Slinger Speedway. <laughs> Why does this small town of a couple thousand people have the world's fastest quarter mile speedway. Nobody knows, <laughs> but my math teacher certainly explained the math of how it could be called the fastest. It's all about the angle of the ramps. Oh. So mm, if I was thinking the mundane, <laughs> if I was thinking of the mundane thing, I'd uh, when you get in the context of the other, you really can think of that. But the mundane, I would think of like the small details. Okay. So maybe like if we want to flesh out our town, like you know what's. What's the town's big thing? Is it that? Is it Rob's frozen custard? Robert, sorry. Robert's frozen custard. <laughs> yep. I think I'm so I grew up in Menominee Falls. Um, and like I know that we're playing on February 25th, but um in Menominee Falls, people are obsessed with the Fourth of July parade. Like this is like the event to be at. People are setting out their chairs three days before the parade starts. They're roping off their areas. Police have to like put up the signs that are like nothing out here before July 3rd. <laughs> they will come. They will confiscate your chair. Like it is like a to do. Um, and so I feel like I want something like that, that people are just like this. And like there's no clear reason why like the Menominee Falls parade is not good. It's not like like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, it's the high school marching band, you yeah. know? Um, but people are into it. I like that. So maybe we have like a belated Valentine's Day Parade. That's what yeah, we're going um, for. It's like for our belated, but it's always specifically belated Valentine's Day Parade. Well, it's near the end of February, right? It's always... Right, yeah. Yeah. But what, what day of the week was uh, February 25th? Uh, I don't know. I'll Google it. So we could just say it's Sadly, the, the last of that day of the, the month. Yeah, every year, because sadly, and I should have thought about this. It was not a leap year. 1996 was a leap. Yeah, year. Mm. very close to uh, that leap year. February 20, 25th, 1997 was the 56th day of the year in the Gregorian calendar. There were 390 days. The day of the week was a Tuesday. <laughs> was a Tuesday. So the last I Tuesday love of February. It even more if the parade is on a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. So we got the last Tuesday of every month. There is a parade to celebrate Valentine's Day uh, in this small town of what's what's their small town name? Oh, um, gosh, we're really good at naming small towns, too. All I've got is Valentine since they have a Valentine's yeah. parade. <laughs> I like, mean, we could just call it Hartford, which is, you know, ah, I love it. <laughs> Hartford. Amazing. Sorry. But it is spelled like Hartford, so it's H A R T. Yeah. Hartford. And we are known for our belated Valentine's Day parade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited to find out that you will now understand all of our ridiculous Wisconsin references that we love. Oh, to yeah. <laughs> so, so it sounds like Hartford's in the Midwest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, just because be, we're right? all from the Midwest. Because I think that that makes it a. I think that makes it like more ridiculous. The idea that you would have a parade on February 25th <laughs> in the Midwest. Oh no. Right. Right. Well, like that's they, the they worst waited idea. As long as they could. They don't want to do it on <laughs> Valentine's Day. Goodness. It's so cold. It's going to be even colder, but February 25th is almost <laughs> March, which it's is almost, almost March, spring. You almost get into spring weather there. Don't, don't worry about right? it. Warm like by the remnants of love. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You could just love will warm you. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, that's the parade motto. Right. We'll put on your mittens. <laughs> love, love will, will keep you warm. Love will that's keep you warm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. 
I love this so much. I would have my I would have gone to that parade every year and loved it. Uh-huh. Yep. Mm. Oh, so good. Okay. So uh that's what we know about our mundane world. Do we need to just like do we want to come up with anything else about it or are we do we feel pretty I mean, confident? I mean that paints in our... a nice picture of this small <laughs> it town. It really does. It really does. Like this cute okay. downtown area, like <laughs> yeah. you know, a couple thousand people. It's all people decorated tops. and yeah. 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 People build little ice sculptures about love. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Sure. Okay. All right. So the magical world. Um, we know it has people with magical powers, and it is high in the sky or in space. Yeah. I kind of like it being in the sky, I think. Okay. I do as well. Because so I think is that's it... a little closer to the mundane world. Yeah. Is it like in the do we want it to be a world that's in the sky, like overall, or is it just in the sky over this small town? Oh, because I have, you know, yeah. you've got both gravity falls. The creatures are just in gravity falls, right. Right. say amphibia. You take a music box, you go to a place that's a complete other dimension. Like mm-hmm. It doesn't right. have to be. I like the because the other thing was that like the the other was a cluster of these other magical worlds. I yeah. like that each of these like magical worlds is over some stupid small town. <laughs> so they're all like these little small town specific magical worlds. You've got you've got small town rivalries on Earth. Right. And then you've got these magical sky societies that also have small town rivalries <laughs> with other <laughs> magical sky society yeah <laughs> that makes yeah. sense like you do love obviously it. you know like <laughs> there's like sky of florida and <laughs> you know oh um, i'm terrified of the sky gators though oh uh-huh. yeah <laughs> real dangerous gotta watch what, out <laughs> what are the what are these uh what do these look like i mean if we can't get to them by plane or anything like that we have well, to you get, get to them by a choreographed dance Ryan. exactly like so how 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 do they look and how do we, I mean, I mean, do we just dance and then tra- transport there or? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what it says. Something I kind of like that we could use as a description. It doesn't fully work because people do know about this world. But my thought is like, when you go through a cloud, you never actually see what's inside it. It gets all like fuzzy and stuff like right. that. So it could be that they're all like, they're, they live in the insides of clouds, and so when planes go through, they just don't interact with them or see them mm. because you can't physically get there by walking. You have to do the dance. Right, right. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. So if you do the dance, you can see it, but like a plane flying through can't see it because they're not doing yeah, the dance. Yeah, straight through. Or, yeah. or the, the other option would be you can see it, you can land there, but to gain entrance, you have to do the choreographed dance before the magical creatures let you in. So you literally... Does each magical world have its own dance that oh, you yeah. have to do? Yeah, 100%. You gotta, you gotta okay. know the flash mob style dance for your yeah. group. Well, because I'm sure it's through. a traditional dance for that magical small town. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm thinking right. like musical level dance groups. <laughs> oh, like it's gotta be like okay. a full song and dance number. Yeah, it might, so, maybe not it. a song with it, but it's gotta be like, uh, you oh, know. Oh, it's even better if there's no music. That's yeah, great. Just, <laughs> just jazz dancey. It's just like uh, an interpretive dance. <laughs> like synchronized leaping and, and all this other yeah. stuff. You know, you okay. have to have the right amount of people in some cases. Um, and okay. then there's like variations depending on group size um, okay. from yeah. individual up to large groups. You've okay. got some that like really love their drum core aesthetic. Some that are are really into ballet. Like mm-hmm. it's all based on the region. Yeah, because right. that would explain why everybody knows them, right? Because instead of like, oh, they're hidden in clouds and and whatnot, it's like they're there. We can go to. Them. They just won't let us in. This is where all of the various TikTok dances came from. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no. We also do, do. Do you know how many? USA presidents, we would now have like videos of doing TikTok dances to gain entrance way to a magical kingdom. Yeah. Oh, that's upsetting. <laughs> it's deeply upsetting. I mean, like Bill Clinton playing the saxophone was already enough. Like <laughs> the idea of like George W. Bush trying to like you know ballet dance is just really upsetting to me. Or or uh, do the robot. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Ronald Reagan just like trying to do the robot scene. <laughs> yeah. Mm -mm. Oh, yeah, it's 97. So, yeah. Yeah, 97. Oh. So it would have been Clinton, right? Because he was elected yeah. in 96. Yeah. 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 Clinton was because, yeah, I know Clinton was president when I was mm -hmm. when I was little. Yeah. Yeah. Because Reagan was president when I was born and then Bush and then Clinton and then Bush again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So Clinton is uh, doing robot dances and uh, the shuffle to get yeah. into uh, into these places. Nixon yeah. refused. Yeah, Nixon always had a staff. I mean, it's that. just for the diplomatic, and then all the staff is going to be dancing as well. Um, well, see, but then if you're saying that like Nixon had somebody else, then like doesn't that mean that like, well, never mind. Oh, it's uh, well, I'm just, like uh, picture. I'm like now is like Spiro Agnew doing this or. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on That's the plus even more side, horrifying. On the plus side, a lot of these are small towns, so it'd be more like doing it on the right. Well, if, I mean, if I get, I don't want to. I don't want to get into whether or not these things as far fall as we under the go. jurisdiction. <laughs> I don't want to get under the voting rights of the Sky Society. Yeah. Like, right. so I'm, okay. I'm going to guess that it's um, they're floating islands, right? Mm -hmm. Small yeah. town size islands that yeah. have some sort of barrier to entry that you need to do the dance to get in. Right. Yeah. Right. Makes mm -hmm. sense to me. And meanwhile, it's just somebody on the other side with a button that like literally if they're not amused enough by your dance, they don't press the button. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> There's like literally yeah, no like, reason for the dance. It's like American dance. Idol on the other side. Like <laughs> um so then it we did determine that it, people there have magical powers. Yes. Um, either magical users, superheroes, etc. What kind of like magic do we think is happening here? Is it different for each small town or is it like one kind of magical? I mean, I'm going to throw magical girls out there because I'm me. But but like, I mean, if there's different styles of magic or superpowers. Well, because then I can have necromancers, too. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. OK. So, yeah, let's say there's different ones, because then we can have, like, superheroes, we can have necromancers, we can have magical girls, we can have... Yeah. And there's people Something that, you know, we... travel, that, like, move from Gnomes. one small town to another small town, right? Yeah. Yeah. So each small town could have its own own type of magic, and if we wanted to, uh, because the Magical Girl uh, playbook, which we'll get into eventually, actually... The Magical Girl playbook requires a dance already, so we could just say that all <laughs> magic comes from their dances. Oh, amazing. Gotcha. Yeah. I which is why works. each... Each town has their own different type of magic. Oh, well, there right. you go. Because they got their own different type of dance. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. It's it's like a local cuisine, you know. The Minnesotans have some sort of juicy Lucy <laughs> magic, which is deeply uncomfortable now that I said the name. But <laughs> people love them, though. I mean, it's a thing. You've it got is. curdle wizards. From... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God. what ha what okay. have we done? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the magical creatures there, com or the, the the creatures in the magical areas come from the other. Yeah. Which we said that the other is a cluster of magical worlds. So the other is just like all of this together. Is that what we've yeah the determined? other in, yeah. So based on the mechanics of the game, the other would basically be any of the other sky societies who are not the one directly connected to the main okay. town. So any of them that one, aren't Hartford. Yeah. Sky Hartford. The, yeah, Sky Hartford. Hartford and Sky Hartford would be our main focus, and then all of the other ones would be the other, presumably the stranger and, and further away there are. And we could mm -hmm. even say, you know, potentially... The other is the kind of thing you explore more as you play. Like, we could even say, yeah. like, maybe maybe there are space towns or something like that, yeah. like, even higher up that we just don't know about or okay. something like that. Could yeah. we could we say then that Sky Hartford, um, since every all the magical creatures came from the other clusters, like, what if Sky Hartford's, like, a newer small town that, like, is people from these magical people and mundane people like are becoming you know families and and making a name for themselves in this this like newer sort of oh, it's like way a little prairie town yeah, yeah something like that where where they're like you've got you know your your regular human neighbors and then you've got your your humans and and 
you know, uh, other creatures living in the same mm-hmm. household and and whatnot. And, and just like it's all just normal uh, blending of all these different cultures and magics and whatnot. Cool. I'm I'm yeah. good with that. I'm fine if I you have like you know some regular people living there and then like Ponyhead next door. Yeah, exactly. It also explain <laughs> how we have uh, potentially if PCs are if we grab magic using PCs how they have different types of magic. Yeah, because yeah. The it, it, it's so like many. the Simpsons if Ned Flanders had uh, a horse for a head and <laughs> <laughs> it would be amazing. Okay, cool. All right. So are there other things that we need to do to build our world or do we feel pretty? Are we good here? Gosh, that is such I feel a good, good world. About Hartford I feel, Sky I feel Hartford. great about Hartford and it's belated Valentine's Day parade. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's got to be like uh, a, a, an equivalent in Sky Hartford. Yeah. Right. Right. For sure. Well, well because especially if people came from Hartford. Too. Yeah. Well, what if, what if they, they like uh, release like, like some, Origami hearts or something from the sky to rain down. Oh, onto like Hartford. there's like confetti. That's adorable. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's really cute. Okay, like my brain Love is working. That. Like what this graphic's gonna look like too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. Amazing. Okay. Now, now are we ready to make some people? I am. I'm so ready. All right. Well, let's make some people then. Okay. Let's make some people. <laughs> Let's make some people. So when it comes to making people, what we're going to do, this is where, or if it's all right, I just kind of jump and explain yeah, the process. Go for it. Yeah, please. That's why you're um, here. <laughs> this is where the fusion of Powered by the Apocalypse and Cypher System really comes into place because I liked both of their systems so much, I did both. <laughs> so our characters... So in a lot of games that you would play, your characters are going to have a specific class or playbook or type or something like that. We have two in Under the Neighborhood. Okay. So every character is going to have a playbook. A playbook is going to describe basically the general big picture things about your character. So we've got the Guardian. The Guardian protects other people. The Weird. The Weird is... Weird, they're from the other. So if you want, you know, man from Sky, Florida, that could be an example of of the weird. Um, or, you know, Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls or something like that. Uh, so you have like kind of big picture ideas of who you are and how you relate to your friends in the other world. And then you have a descriptor. A descriptor is a hyper specific thing you can do. You cast spells, you change your face, you have an evil twin. All of these are descriptors. And so what happens is you'll end up taking these two together and making a character with a simple summary. So, for example, John Jimbo is the weird who changes his face Mm. is an example like that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to choose a playbook. It'll walk us through a bunch of smaller choices. We're then going to choose a descriptor. Once we have both of those We'll make a bunch of smaller decisions about our characters. Once we've got a basic mechanical idea of what we would have the most fun with, then we're going to start figuring out things like what's our character's name? What's our age? Where are they from? Are they from Hartford or Sky Hartford? And once we fleshed out, once we've gotten these big things, that once we've gotten the playbook and descriptor and fleshed out all the details and figured out who we want to be, the system then encourages us to go back to some of the early mechanical decisions we made and adjust them to better fit the character that we've put together. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's the general process, but where we'll start is we will pick a playbook. The game has eight core playbooks. It's recommended that you don't have any two people play the same playbook or use the same descriptor. So we have eight core playbooks in the game. We additionally create additional content for our Patreon backers, which at least at this moment is Patreon exclusive in years down the line might get a deluxe version. And so typically I wouldn't bring those up, but one of those playbooks was a magical girl playbook. So I felt the need to share it here. (laughs) Well, I'm not going to choose that one. I'm just kidding. It's... (laughs) Of course, I'm going uh, to choose like the magical girl. I'd like to see girl. you 
Yeah, seriously, right. try to resist it for the second time. <laughs> Yeah, so our first step, even before we have a name or anything else figured out, is figuring out what kind of character, what kind of relationship do we want? Do we want to be a magical girl who's both worlds? Do we want to be an opportunist who is a grunkle stan, wheeler and dealer? Do we want to be a mon trainer? Do we want to catch those sky gators? All right. (laughs) Gotta catch them all, sky gators. I honestly, ever since Sky Florida came up, I have been really eyeing the Mon Trainer. Uh-huh. Um, it's definitely one of our our classes are kind of split between. We've got ones that are much more mundane and designed for newer players. Things like the Guardian, the Intuition, the Journalist. You're a regular person. It's just how you approach the world. And then we have some weirder ones like the Mon Trainer or the Divided who gets their magic from some sinister source or an animal companion in case you want to be the Sky Gator. Right. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. I want you to guess. I mean, the one that stood out was the Divided for you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, there is no question. <laughs> like I love I love my I love my little edgy playbook. I know. Like if, if you're going to make a playbook for Amelia, that's the one. <laughs> it's true um so as as we're choosing playbooks some things for folks to know we're going to choose our playbook which describes our type we're then going to choose some stat loadouts so i have two pre-generated ones based on who you are so i'll mention now i'm going to choose the mon trainer so you've got the dueling is fun i love having fun times with my partners kind of <laughs> atch Kesham thing and then you've also got the yugi moto I will use this card game to destroy you. Dueling is death loadout. So we're going to choose those. And then from there, we're going to choose a handful of moves. Depending on the playbook, some have uh, less moves, some have more moves. Okay. So it looks like the loadouts determine what your stat is going to be, what your stat spread yeah. will be. And stats are things that we can adjust later on. But we, I like starting with these loadouts to kind of give us an idea a basic idea without getting mired in the details of what am I prioritizing? I like that. Um, So it looks like uh, you've got kind of a standard sort of PBTA spread between uh, negative one and plus two for the highest. Yeah. So it's, I I extend the spread out a bit more. I believe it goes from negative two to plus three just because balance has no place in this world, but yeah, basic (laughs) PBTA spread where I do it, I'm never going to put uh, you're never going to start with more than plus two or very rarely more than minus one. Although there are a couple of playbooks where people go as low as minus two. Right. Oh, that's interesting. And then at the end, uh, all of them should equal out to a plus one. Mm hmm. I'd originally considered having it equal out to zero to make it more of a really enforcing the you're just a regular person. Mm -hmm. But with that spread, it was a lot harder to give people really fun specialties. So I ended up switching it back to overall. They should all equal plus one. Right. So I'm looking at the stats and I I, I, I've made characters for enough games to kind of guess what most of these are. So you've got heart. Books, fierce and slick. Heart heart feels like the like kind of a social sort of uh, stat. Uh, books feels more like a like a like a book smarts intellect sort of uh, what can you recall sort of thing. Um, fierce sounds like a like a fighty fighty uh, sort of uh, stat, and then slick feels. Um, underhanded, maybe? Yeah, so, exactly. You you nailed all of them. So all of the stats focus less on abilities and more on how you approach situations. But that's exactly right. So, like, heart, if you want to get insight into someone, you're going to use heart. If you want to use something arcane, that would be books. If you want to punch something, you're going to use fierce. And then slick is exactly... uh, underhanded or the way I like to think of it is someone who keeps themselves cool and composed. So of the two basic moves for slick, because each of them has two basic moves associated with them. Slick is used for the stealth role 
and for a move called keep your cool, which is what you do when, say, you're in a stressful situation, but you have to do something with finesse because someone who's slick is able to maintain their composure, move stealthily and sneakily and smoothly. Okay. Um, so oftentimes underhanded people will have an extremely high amount of slick. Yeah. But you don't necessarily need to be underhanded to do that. Okay. That makes sense. So I think I've figured out what loadout I'm going to take then based on that. Yeah. Figured out mine as well. Got yours over there, Amelia. Um, I'm trying to decide. Is it? It feels like a tough decision, right? Because like this feels like the core uh, branching off of what your character is going to be, right? Yeah. Right. It definitely is important. Uh, but one important thing is that uh, stat loadouts, we actually have a point later on where you can, based on the other choices you made, go back and adjust your stats. Mm. So at this stage, that's why we recommend at this stage just choosing one of the two loadouts as a way of just getting it out there immediately, like getting a basic idea of I want a character who's more focused on this or one who's more focused on that. Right. And then later on, once we fleshed out the specifics of who your character is, we'll come back and say, OK, well, I actually made a character who was not nearly as composed as I thought they were. Mm -hmm. Or I made a character who actually is really bad with people. So even though he is a good boy, <laughs> I should probably move his heart down a little bit because he just does not understand anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, this early mechanical phase is really just getting stuff out there. What mechanics look most fun to me? And then once we add our character, once we figure out our character from the mechanics, we'll go back and then adjust the mechanics. Right. Okay. All right. So so I've got mine. Um, I had to choose between the power of friendship and action girl. Uh, and I went with action girl, uh, which gave me a plus one to heart, uh, plus zero to books, plus one to fierce and minus one to slick. So okay. it feels like this character likes to jump head first into action. And uh, if things get a little too heated, uh, not the greatest at handling that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my choices were, let me scroll back down to it. Um, I could do violent magic or delved too deep. Um, cause I picked the divided playbook. Um, I went with delved too deep so Perfect. that I can have, uh, zero heart plus two books, zero fierce and minus one slick. Ooh. It's a nerd. <laughs> and then I uh, I went with the Mon Trainer uh, because I, again, the second I thought Sky Gators, I thought I must have one. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, my character is going to be a Mon Trainer. I'm going to have a bunch of cuddly little creatures. And between mine, I had dueling is fun and dueling is death. And I've decided I want to play a good boy. So I chose dueling is fun, which has plus two heart plus one books, minus one fierce, and minus two slick. Oh, wow. We are the least slick group of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does anybody here have any... Yeah, the highest slick we have is minus one so far. Well, we just we just never stealth, never hide. Just never get never into a, a bad situation. Yeah. Because that'll never be happen. Fine. Well, listen... Fierce has its own move called Take Action, where as long as you don't care about doing something well and you just care about doing something fast, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> Call to action. Yeah, like that. OK, I was so excited about this game. Yeah. Um, the moment you told me like what the premise was, I was like, this is for me. I know. <laughs> um, and like, as we started making our characters, it got even more for me. I know. Um, I was, oh gosh, it's so good. This is, this is a genre of TV that I've really been enjoying. I think any mm -hmm. parent will tell you that there are, uh, there's, there's a plethora of children's shows that are like oh, yeah. intolerable. Uh -huh. Um, and then there are good ones that you like to sit down and watch with your kids. Yep. And so these definitely fall into that latter category of like, these are fun and also for grownups too. Yeah. Oh, and plus they teach like great morals and stuff to our yeah. kids. 
It's yeah. so good. Well, and like uh, a number of them are starting to have like queer relationships and, yes. you know, starting to explore those kinds of things like Nate. Spoilers, I guess. Maybe I shouldn't say all of this. Um, but, like, Nate will come running in and being like, guess what? Um, so I won't say specifically when or where or any of that. Um, but, <laughs> no yeah, spoilers. It's, it's exciting to, like, see that kind of stuff, too, and see that that's what my kids are being yeah. exposed to. And just, like, the, the whimsy of it. it. It is a lot better than the mindless action cartoon number 475 with random animal characters and who knows what else. Right. Right. If I have to watch any more animal friends crap. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I'm very excited because uh, I am uh, going to be on the one shot for uh, the this game for IPM this year. Oh, cool. That's yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kyle's going to be running that game, and I, I'm one of the players. So i got to look into IPM stuff and see like if I can. I've never done any of it. Yeah. Um, anyway. There, there's, there's always next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before we uh, let you go for the week, uh, we do have some calls to action. Um, I also do have a, a a very personal message that I wanted to get out there um, right at the top here. Um, yesterday, as of the recording of this, uh, which would have been, what, last week, Tuesday, I think, um, had to say goodbye to one of my cats, uh, Trixie, uh, who was a 16-year-old calico cat, uh, very mischievous, hence her name. Uh, <laughs> Named after uh, Trixie Little Hobbitses uh, from Lord of the Rings, um, which uh, I, I always get a li- delight out of uh, thinking about that. Um, but uh, we had uh, the in-home uh, veterinarian thing uh, come over and uh, take care of all of that, and it it was a it was a good experience, I think. Um, yeah, like, as, as good as those kinds of things can can be, but like you got to be there and um, yeah, you know, you kind of kn- knew it was coming. So yeah, like to... she she had been pretty sick for the last uh, you know couple months or so. Yeah, um, and then really declined uh, the weekend prior, and uh, and we knew it was time at that point. Um, you know, sixteen unfortunately, is like sixteen's quite old for a yeah. cat. Um, so she had a good life. I mean, we, we rescued her. We <laughs> rescued her down in Atlanta in 2006 when uh, when she was just 15 weeks old. Oh, wow. Um, and she lived with a broken leg for a week on the street. Ugh. Um, so like she, she, and and it was pouring one day and my friend and neighbor um, was coming home from somewhere. And here comes Trixie running down the hill right at her meowing. So like, she was like, I need help. Please help me. Can you help me? And so we did. And she's been with me ever since. So um, it, it was particularly hard, but we're recovering. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was an expense that we didn't really plan for. So um, I'm putting myself out there to do some uh some freelance sound design so if anybody is in need of those services if you like what you hear for the quality of this show um you can reach out to me at sounddesign.lordneptune.com and that'll uh that'll get you to my uh contact form well especially with ipm coming up too there might be some some people that are looking for yeah 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 for a little extra help. So. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm currently, until I uh, recoup my expenses, uh, running uh, 20% off um, oh, nice. my my services. So you can, uh, you can hire me to clean up your audio and make you sound fantastic for 20% less. Very uh, nice. So that's really nice. Um, and if you, uh, if you want, uh, feel free. Uh, no, no pressure or obligation. You could also donate to my PayPal at paypal.me slash Lord Neptune. Um, and that'll just go right to my personal PayPal account. Um, I, th- I think we recouped like 
forty percent so far. Oh wow! Of the cost, which is nice. Um, awesome. So thank you to those who were able to give because it it really means a lot to m- me and my family. So well, and there's like nothing worse than like losing a pet and then them being like, "Here's the bill." Yeah, like, exactly. I, have I not paid for this emotionally? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, Have you not done enough? <laughs> why can't our society work on emotional payment? Right? Uh, I've done the work. If um, only. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I'm, I'm glad you seem like you're you're doing as well as can be expected. Yep. So, um Yeah, it's it's moved into the acceptance phase, I think. Yeah. Um and and things are going fine. Um we're we're taking it one day at a time. It's only been a day. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I hope that it gets easier from here. And I know that you get to a point where, like, you you have all those good memories and, like, that's Mm -hmm. what you remember about it, you know? Yeah, Um, absolutely. So hopefully that time comes sooner rather than later for you. Yeah. And if you want to see, uh, Trixie, uh, her picture, I, I did a thread about it, uh, the day before. Mm -hmm. Um, with a whole bunch of pictures of her on Twitter, on my Twitter, um, is, uh, she, she's adorable. So, uh, well, well worth checking out those pictures because she is, she was so photogenic. (laughs) (laughs) I love how some pets just are. You're like, you're just so beautiful. (laughs) I agree. Uh, but, uh, that, that's it for my personal message. Uh, we do have some other uh, official announcements. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'll hand it over to Amelia for our first one. We uh, would like to remind you that if you enjoyed Series 51, the Alchemistress's Kickstarter is still going for another few weeks. They are mm-hmm. currently about $500 away from their goal. It would be incredible to get them all the way to their hardcover stretch goal. Um, mm-hmm. But right now that is a ways away. So they need your help. It is an awesome game. So if you can check it out, please do so. Absolutely. We'll have a link uh, in the show notes. Yep. Uh, we've currently had our Patreon for a month, and we are very uh, incredibly grateful for the support that we've gotten so far. Uh, part of our $10 tier is monthly video hangouts with us. But in celebration of our first month, we are opening up the call to all of our patrons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we wanted a chance for everyone to meet and chat. Uh, so this month, all of our patrons, $1 and up, will be able to join our call. Uh, but there is a catch. It's tomorrow, yes. <laughs> July, July 5th. <laughs> it's like literally the day after or the day of that you're listening to this because July 4th is a holiday and there's probably people celebrating. Um, at, at it's going to be July 5th at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, or if you are uh, overseas, uh, that translates to uh, midnight, uh, July 6th, GMT. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on that note, we'd like to take some time to thank our patrons. We'll start with the new people since our last recording, which there have been several. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first, Shadim Cabal, thank you so much. Yeah, Mega Haplius, thank you so much. Benjamin Sweeney, thank you for your support. Lorcan McGinnis, thank you. Rob Fletcher, thank you for supporting us. Kevin Brown, thank you. Uh, And of course, we're going to continue to thank our existing patrons. Uh, Lieutenant, thank you very much for being our first. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Eric Bonds, thank you as well for your support. David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you so much. And Daryl Holiday II, thank you as well. And Matt Newton, thank you for your support. Mm-hmm. And we have a review. What? A review? Oh, this is uh, this is a good uh, this call is what to you action. Needed. I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, this makes me so happy. Remember, you can leave us reviews on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, and Podcast Addict, Facebook, uh, wherever else. If you find other places, let us know. Uh, We are also tweeting out 
old reviews just for fun um, yeah. on our Five Star Friday on Twitter, too. So on top of us reading it here, you can probably see it on our Twitter and Instagram and stuff. Too. Get your own fancy graphic. Woo. <laughs> Uh, but this one is uh, coming to us from the United States of America on iTunes from Oldest Newbie, uh, titled Fun Way to Explore Games. And they said, even though they had trouble answering my unusual question in their question and answer episode, I am impressed that they tried. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the best podcast to find out about new games and see if the game fits your desires. Okay, I'm I super curious which question this was. I'm curious. Um, because we went by first names for most of them, so I don't know, uh, oldest newbie, who you are. Um, oh, I, I, there, I there were what, quite a few good questions on there that what? were a little uh, a little different. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm now i got to look at the list and, and see if we can cross-check it in. Well, yeah, I don't think there was anybody with that username because, like I said, everybody did it with their with their actual I know. real names. So we may never know. We may never um, know. But thank Could you for submitting a question, and I'm glad that you think we tried. <laughs> <laughs> we we certainly did. That's for yes. sure. Um, well, on that note, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Please remember to stay safe, take care of yourselves, relax your shoulders, get some sleep, drink some water. All that good stuff. We will be back next week and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com where you will find other great shows like A Horror Borealis. A Horror Borealis is an actual play Monster of the Week podcast set in the 1990s in the fictional town of Revenant, Alaska just south of the nation's least visited national park and way north of everything else. A reclusive small game hunter with a magical secret, a young anarchist librarian with a passion for conspiracy theory, and a sensible park ranger with a strong local book club following find themselves pulled together by common threads woven mysteriously into their past when monsters begin plaguing their tiny community. But they soon discover the things they're fighting run much deeper and much closer to home. Tune in for a story about identity, empathy, community, mental illness, and healing. And stay for the beloved local diner.